Welcome to the year according to Mike Graham and what a year it's been. Uh, we're going to look back on it right now uh, with me, of course, and my good friend and colleague, the stalwart of Talk TV, Mr Kevin O'Sullivan. Kevin, welcome to the show. Um, we thought this was a good opportunity for us to do a bit of, uh, of our usual stuff together yeah. because we did a lot together this year. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to have a look back at all of the deep dives that I did into all sorts of things, uh, all the way from Ramona's, the BBC, Jeremy <laughs> Corbyn, Keir Starmer, Doctor Who. We're going to get through all of it. Uh, we're going to get Kevin's thoughts on everything that happened this year as well. Uh, Let's kick it off, first of all, with our first deep dive into the former First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon. <laughs> Nicola Sturgeon joined the Scottish National Party at the age of 16 and quickly rose through the ranks. Even as a child, she showed real talent. She saw this muffin and the crooked man. They were bobbing with Mary and a little lamb. It was Nicola was ambitious and became the youngest candidate in the 1992 general election. The rise in support has obviously been um, translated across the board in Scotland now, but it's been there amongst young people for some time. But there was no stopping Sturgeon and in 2007 she became Deputy First Minister to Alex Salmond. Nicola Sturgeon, Scottish National Party, 9,000. <laughs> But when Scotland voted against independence in 2014, Salmond resigned and Sturgeon became Queen. And the only challenge to Nicola Sturgeon taking over was how many adoring fans she could fit in a hall. Nicola soon became hungry for power and was convinced that everyone in Scotland wanted independence. A warhead detonated under Dumfries will break Scotland clean away, sending us out into the North Sea where we will bounce off Norway and come to rest next to Denmark, leaving us irrevocably part of Europe for the rest of time. Sadly, though, Nicola was completely wrong. No tenso. Many other no's followed. Nicola hit the headlines again this year when she put a trans rapist in a women's prison. Here she is explaining exactly why this was a good idea. There is circumstances in which a trans woman uh, will be housed in the male prison estate. Is there any the context in which a woman born as a woman will be housed in the male estate? Look, we're talking here about trans women. And I'm now asking about women born as women. Uh, I don't think there are circumstances there, uh, but... So it's different for trans women? Well, yes. And then in February, Nicola surprised us all and resigned as First Minister of Scotland. Nobody knows why, including her. I know it might seem sudden, but I have been wrestling with it, albeit with oscillating levels of intensity for some weeks. But there's more. In April, Nicola's husband was arrested. Peter Murrell is no longer in this house. He is facing a barrage of questions from detectives as this investigation gathers pace. Then in June, just when you thought you'd seen everything, Nicola was arrested as well. Uh, the last few days have been obviously difficult, quite traumatic. It turns out the SNP were having a few financial issues, something to do with a camper van and her mother-in-law. A £100,000 luxury motorhome was reportedly wheeled away from the house in Fife as part of the active investigation into SNP finances. Nicola may be gone, but it's good to know Scotland is in safe hands with the new SNP leader, Humza Useless. <laughs> That's my deep dive into the rise and fall of Nicola Sturgeon. Now, let's meet an expert and find out where it all went wrong. I mean, the great thing about doing these shows, Kevin, uh, yeah, that, is, is that you've forgotten half of the stuff that, that happened this year with Nicola Sturgeon. I mean, incredible. Because remember, just after um, old uh, Horseface down in New Zealand decided to chuck it all in. Yeah, I said that. I said that. Suddenly, Nicola Sturgeon said, oh, I've got plenty of uh, gas left in my tank. I'm not going anywhere. A week later, she's gone. Yeah, she, her tank ran empty uh, incredibly Very quickly, swiftly, yeah. unexpectedly. Uh, I mean, looking back on that, just as that uh, footage was playing, you and I uh, just... Roaring Howling. with laughter. <laughs> it's, a, it's a comedy show. It's a it's shambles. A joke, isn't it? And you know Nicola Sturgeon, she reminds me of Angela Merkel. Yeah. One of those people, a colossus of Scottish politics, yes. a colossus of right. United Kingdom politics. She was useless. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's hard to say this, but I think she might have been more useless than her successor, Mr. Yes. Useless. Yes, well, I mean, it's hard to say because he's done nothing good. And she, I mean, will now forever be remembered, apart from the motorhome, cutting the bottoms off doors in schools, remember, so that yeah, they could be better yeah. uh, ventilated yeah. during COVID. Yeah. I mean, but how could Scotland's politics have got so 
crap. Yeah, right. uh, yeah. Any ruthless COVID measure you can do, yeah. I can do better. Right. That was her. She got into a competition with Boris Johnson about, hey, hey, you think you're being tough on COVID? Yeah. I'm chopping the bottoms off classroom doors. Right. It was ridiculous. And, you know, of course we can't make uh, confirmed allegations here, but, you know, she's plunged the uh, Scottish National Party or her... Uh, her uh, being in charge of the Scottish National Party has ended in that party being in a financial nightmare, yeah. in a legal nightmare. The police are investigating. God knows what's going to happen right. to her. And Hamza useless, uh, is useless, and the Scottish National Party look to be finished yeah. up there. Unbelievable. And, and, and incredibly, having run the place for such a long time, people that wanted independence still quite would like to see some kind of second referendum, but they don't want the SNP in charge anymore. Uh, so they've kind of thrown away the golden goose, haven't yeah, they? Not yeah. only have they killed it, um, they buried it six feet under and nobody's ever going to see it again. Yeah, and the Scottish National Party, I mean, their, their one and only cause is the independence right. of Scotland. Uh, they lost that vote, was it 2014? Yeah. She's been banging away at it ever since. And just before her right. demise, you know, she took uh, Westminster to court to say, we yeah. do have the right to a second referendum. Uh, Supreme Court very quickly said, uh, uh, no, no, you don't. no, you don't. No. no, you don't. And also, the other thing that hasn't changed is the numbers uh, game. So the numbers of people who voted yes and no yeah. is basically the same as it was in 2014. So they haven't made their case mm -hmm. any more believable yeah. in all that time. But if they had that vote tomorrow, I, I think the Scots would vote to stay. And at that point, though, when, the, when uh, it was ruled that she can't have a second referendum, what was the point of her? She went from being someone who was telling the Scottish people, I will give you independence. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what will happen then. I don't know whether or not we'll have a currency. Uh, I'll bring you into the EU. Oh, wait a minute, the EU don't want us. Yeah. Uh, so uh, at that point, she said, we are the Scottish Independence Party uh, that can't bring you independence. That's when yeah. she became a pointless individual and the Scottish National Party became absolutely yeah. redundant. It was absolutely ridiculous. Another organisation that had a pretty tough 2023 uh, is what you might regard as the police. In the good old days, a policeman was a guardian of law and order. He will be patrolling his area. It's called a beat, maintaining law and order, helping those who require help, and giving advice to those who seek it. Everybody had respect for a man in a uniform. The British policeman does not carry a gun. A truncheon is his only weapon of defence. And because of the respect that all people have for his uniform, it is quite exceptional for it to be used. And you were never far away from a bobby on the beat. In Great Britain, there is an average of one policeman to every 650 persons. In this city, there are 400 policemen, of which about 100 are on duty at any one time. These days, modern policing looks very different. With only 5% of burglaries being solved, these preening police officers have far more important things to do, like dancing the Macarena. And when they're not dancing, these righteous rosers insist on taking the knee. So they have all taken a knee. They've all taken a knee. And sometimes they can arrest you for hurty words, especially if they look like your lesbian grandmother. Her nana is a lesbian, she's married to a woman. She's not on the phone, we love what you're clenching your face. Go away from my teenage daughter. What is up with you? Right. You're, you're in something wrong with you, you, mate. Here she is again, pepper spraying some innocent children. All in a day's work for lesbian nana. But don't worry, if the fuzz have given up fighting crime, you can always rely on the older generation to do the job for them. And that's my deep dive into the rise and fall, and fall, of the police force. Now, let's meet an expert.
I mean, it's hard to imagine a worse year for the police, isn't it? From the Metropolitan Police to the West Mercia Police to the Manchester Police. They're all uh, in special measures. Yeah. They're all, they've all forgotten how to be police. Absolutely. And uh, that footage, that old uh, sort of uh, film of the ancient yeah. traditional police. So you notice that uh, police cyclist yeah. going downhill. Yes. And that is an analogy for the police. I mean, they are hurtling downhill. Yeah. They have no idea how to police this country. Uh, they become the woke police force yeah. who are far more interested in patrolling the tweets yeah. than patrolling the streets. It's a disgrace. Uh, That's good, know, that. I like that. And they talk about, they talk about oh, look, there's, they've got a truncheon here. Well, now, uh, a lot of them carry guns, yeah. quite rightly, in my view. Uh, the fact that we still go, oh, we shouldn't arm the police. What, in this country? Yeah. We should arm the damn right. police. Uh, we give them guns and uh, quite often, I think, uh, absolutely justifiably, they discharge their weapons, yeah. these officers, these armed police officers, and guess what? They then get prosecuted yes. for, you know, breaking the law. And they get this, kicked out of yeah, the police. Yeah, and then they get kicked out of the police force. Uh, they, they have become the uh, police force of wokery. Yeah. And it's an absolute joke. And, uh, you know... Uh, you, you, if you uh, tweet something saying, oh, you know, I'm not sure about this, that and the other, they'll be down on you. Uh, but if you want to nick a bike, nick yeah. someone's car, beat someone up in the street, yeah, forget it. Forget yeah. it. And look at that copper there in that film. Uh, an old age pensioner yeah. has to deal with a criminal. And what about these uh, Palestinian marches, these yeah. pro-Palestinian marches we've seen? 150 thousand people marching through London, most of them Jew haters, yeah. as far as I'm concerned, you know, with with anti-Semitic slogans. Yeah. How many how many arrests was made were made in right. London on the first 150,000 strong pro Not very many. Nine. 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 Yeah. Ridiculous. Because they why? Say. I'll tell you why, Mike. Because they were too scared yeah. to arrest anyone. Well, they arrested also a bloke who had a British uh, flag, didn't they? Or arrested a guy who had an England yeah. flag. Yeah. But that's the trouble. You know, they can't tell the difference between people who are just marching and people who are actually genuinely mm. doing something illegal. Mm. And they don't want to arrest anyone who's doing anything illegal because it's too much trouble. But the other problem they've got is they've got loads of people in the police now who've got criminal records. <laughs> and they can't get rid of them either. You know, you'd think, would you not, actually... If you want to be a police officer, you probably shouldn't have a criminal record. But they've got loads of people in there who have been done for drugs offences, who have been done for sex offences, mm -hmm. who have been done for, uh, for drugs... Domestic dealing. violence. I mean, domestic thing. violence. Massive Unbelievable. Yeah. Incredible. But I don't know how it's got so bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Metropolitan Police are the worst, probably. When we were young, Mike, admitted it a long time ago, it wasn't co long co coppers ago. were not even allowed to break, you know, sp to, to break the speeding limit no. in their cars. They broke the speeding limit. They lost their goddamn yeah, yeah. jobs. Right. Now, you know, uh, you know, they can, they can beat their wives up. Yeah. They can, uh, you know, commit terrible crimes. They can send WhatsApp messages about how funny right. rape is. Right. And they continue to be coppers. The Met Police, what a damn joke. What an absolute joke. Mm. This city that we live in, other cities around the country as well, are not being served by our ludicrous, woke left-wing police forces. Yeah, they just don't know what on earth they're doing. And, I mean, I don't know where Guinness is going to go in the next uh, few years because if the Labour government get in, they're not going to be any better at policing them because they'll be even more woke and they'll be even more ridiculous. Yeah. But let's now go uh, to another group of people who raised their voices again uh, only recently this year. And you might think they would have forgotten about what happened, you know, seven years ago when there was a referendum on whether or not we should leave the European Union. These are, of course... The Ramonas. The United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union on the 23rd of June 2016, and everybody instantly agreed to abide by the decision. This means that the UK has voted to leave the European Union. 52% of the British population celebrated, including everybody's favourite Brexiteer, and Whittacombe. 17.4 million people in the biggest democratic turnout in British history voted to leave. Nigel Farage also took the news well, although I'm not sure others did. You know, when I came here 17 years ago and I said that I wanted to lead a campaign to get Britain to leave the European Union, you all laughed at me. Well, I have to say, you're not laughing now, are you? Nigel bid a fond farewell to the European Parliament, but all they cared about was his flag. Please sit down, resume your seats, put your flags away, you're leaving, and take them with you. Sadly, 
Not everyone took the news as well. Alistair Campbell was the first of many complainers, or as they're now known, Ramonas. I'll buy you lunch. Let's, I mean, let's, no, I don't let's want celebrate. Lunch. I don't let's have want fun. lunch. Because lunch to me will be a waste of time when I can spend my time trying to stop this madness. You're not going to stop me tell it. You. It's all over. Well, I don't agree it's done. with you. It's done. Anna Subri was also in tears. Apparently, so was her elderly mother and both of her daughters. Ramoni is a family affair. My mother is 84 and she wept on Friday. Just like my 24 and 25 year old daughters shed tears because we made a terrible mistake. And who could forget the much loved 90s star Terry Christian? This rampant Ramona wanted everyone who voted Brexit to die. For a Let second. me just say what you've tweeted. Yeah. This was in uh, August uh, 2019. Uh, it's a flu, you said, so mainly OAPs. If they voted to destroy our lives by voting Brexit, uh -huh. let's hope it's a good virulent strain this year. Oh, good, yeah, let me You literally wanted... And the king of all the Ramonas was Steve Bray, also known as Mr Stop Brexit. For the last 15 months, Steve Bray has endeavoured to stand outside Parliament day after day after day. Every day its members are in session, in fact. Seven years later, these resilient Ramonas are still angry with democracy. They won't take no for an answer, even if it means filling the Royal Albert Hall with EU flags. <laughs> Ramonas also have a lot of time on their hands, and they love to march, and there's many ways to protest but Ramonas believe contemporary dance is the most effective way to get their point across. And that's my deep dive into the wonderful world of Ramonas. Now let's meet an expert to find out why these losers want to rejoin the European Union. I mean, those people dancing, uh, you'd have to say. I mean, it's almost like they call it sort of derangement syndrome about Donald Trump. There's a definite EU derangement syndrome, isn't it? These rejoiners who want to keep having marches and keep trying to make out that everything that's going wrong in Britain is all to do with Brexit. And if only we'd stayed in the European Union, we'd be fine. Well, we wouldn't be fine, would we? Absolutely not. And uh, you saw Al Alistair Campbell there. Uh, the reason he was so furious, we're going to stop this madness. What do you mean madness? Yeah, right. That was a democratic vote a democratic decision of the British people. Yes. That's not, that's not madness. And uh, the body politic has to learn to accept that if the majority of people in this free country want something and they vote for it, that has to happen. And uh, what drove the likes of Campbell and all the rest of them, Steve Bray, just get a job, mate, you lazy son of a bee. <laughs> uh, I mean, seriously, <laughs> get a job. Uh, what drove Campbell mad and the Blairs of this world is they were used to controlling the people. They thought that we would always be compliant with what they want and that they could manipulate us mm. into doing what they want. And suddenly the British people in 2016 stood up and said, actually, what you want us to do, we don't want to do. We want to leave that sclerotic waste of time, the EU, and we want to forge our own future for this great country. And I still think we can do it. Uh, I'm worried about Keir Starmer coming in, uh, but hopefully, because he's a political coward, like most people in right. Labour are, that he will not have the guts to stand up and say to the people, you made a wrong decision mm. and I'm going to change it and we're going to rejoin. Well, there's nothing to suggest that the European Union has suddenly gone from strength to strength ever since we left it, because it hasn't. Um, it's quite frankly, if anything, it's gone the other way, because you've now got a big movement in Italy of people who think they should be leaving it. There are plenty France, of people in France who want to go. Uh, they've already started started reversing some of those ridiculous rules mm -hmm. that they put in about, mm -hmm. you know, you can only come now to France for 90 days at a time yeah. or in Spain yeah. for 90 days at a time. They're about to change all that because a lot of people said, oh, you can't go and live in a foreign country anymore. Well, you actually can. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can't travel. Oh, you know, freedom of movement. Oh, you know, now they're telling us that when they bring in this new passport system, we're all going to be queuing up for hours and hours to get into Europe. They said that before. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen. Yeah. You and I go to Europe all the time. Yeah. I've actually found uh, airports where going in as a Brit is actually better yeah. because the EU yeah. queue is longer than the non-EU yeah. queue. And so actually, I haven't seen any reason to, to regret leaving the European Union yeah, at yeah. all. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, people go, oh, look at the country falling apart at the seams since we voted to leave and since Boris actually got us to leave. 
What? I don't, I don't sense it. I don't sense that this country is uh, in any way materially worse than no. it was before we left. I mean, disappointingly, I think it's around about the same. Uh, but l whether or not we're a member of that useless Brussels club, yeah. I don't think makes any difference whatsoever. No. And by the way, you heard it here probably last, uh, before uh, Campbell and Blair and Starmer get their way and we rejoin the EU, the EU will cease to exist because yeah. more and more countries are saying, you know what, you're a waste of time and they really are. Yeah, exactly right. Happy New Year to all of you people in the EU. Uh, we don't hate you, uh, we just don't want to be told what to do by you. It's that simple. Uh, coming up next on the year, according to Mike Graham, we're going to look at the BBC and maybe a bit of climate change fanaticism as well. This is Talk TV. I mean, it is the festive season and there's plenty to be festive about, but there's also plenty to look back upon from the last year, 2023. Uh, and who could say that you wouldn't have a perfect year without the BBC? Because Kevin, uh, we'll have a look at this in a minute, um, they've made so many mistakes at the BBC, we could do a whole programme on them. But have a look at this, my deep dive into the BBC. BBC television first launched in 1936, and straight away it was a huge success. Television had something for everyone. There was art. In the last few months I've been taking works from the London galleries to the Alexandra Palace, but I've kept in mind all the time the high percentage of so-called modern art. There was roller skating. <laughs> and there was even tap dancing. <laughs> Who could ask for more? Well. The executives at the BBC were concerned that viewers may not know how to pay for this, so they helpfully produced these friendly commercials to show you how. Yes, there's a TV set on number five. It's in the front room. And they're watching Columbo. If you don't have a TV licence, it won't take us long to find you. The BBC is loved around the world for its award-winning drama. Who could forget when EastEnders attracted 30 million viewers? These days, Lucky to get one million. Although looking at this, I'm not surprised. <laughs> the BBC prides itself on the highest journalistic standards. When you're presenting live news, you've got to be ready for anything. Breaking news, last minute interviews, and even putting on your shoes. Sorry about that delay. Presenting live TV is also better when you turn off your phone. Look, my advice to him is not Somebody to listen to my to telephone, over, never mind. The BBC collected almost £4 billion from the public last year and has 12 regional newsrooms delivering the very best in local journalism. Hello, good morning. We start with an apology. We have got a problem here in the studio with the lights. I hope that you can still hear me. The BBC also employs the best weather presenters. The first thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. So look at it. Fabulous. The sun is beating down. We've seen lots of doggers, lots of, not doggers, of course, lots of dog walkers and joggers. The BBC loves to educate us about climate change too. In July, Spain had a little heat wave. So their climate editor jetted off to Alicante for the day. He blamed the heat wave on carbon emissions. I wonder if his jet had anything to do with it. Climate change is pushing temperatures up and making the heat waves like this longer and more extreme. Earlier this year, the NHS celebrated its 75th birthday. Sadly, over 7 million people are still waiting for hospital treatment and thousands can't see their GP. But don't worry about any of that. Here is how the People's Republic of the BBC marked the occasion. And that is my deep dive into the BBC. Now let's find out why almost three million people have stopped paying their TV tax.
I don't think BBC have had a worse year yeah. in the entire history of the organisation, have they? I mean, I'm so old, Mike, I can remember when the BBC was worth watching. Yes, uh, it me hasn't, too. It hasn't been worth watching, uh, you know, for decades. Yeah. Uh, and currently, it's a national disgrace. It is. And uh, they have the temerity to say we're already paying £159 a year uh, for a service that is far worse than Netflix. Uh, and they want to put it up mm. to £173.30. Yeah. This is a disgrace. This is a tax on crap television. Yeah. You know, the ITV is it's also... It's not just crap, but I, it's woke as well. Yeah, yeah, that's my point. ITV is also woke and useless, yeah. but not quite as woke and useless as the BBC. It is currently engaged in killing off lots and lots of fashionable, yes. pro, you know, popular programmes because they're no longer mm. fashionable. Question of sport. Yeah. You know, used to be presented by David Coleman, Sue Bug. Oh, let's get rid of them. Let's yeah, make yeah. it fashionable. Too old, get rid yeah, of them. Get rid of them. Yeah. And uh, you know, they've just had to axe it because Sue Barker was pulling in four million viewers a week. Uh, Paddy McGuinness immediately plumped it, plumped, plummeted it to 780,000. They yeah. had to axe it. Uh, BBC question, uh, the BBC Sports Personality yeah. of the Year oh, that only, was dreadful only year, recently uh, uh, appointed... Uh, the winner, mm. Mary Earps. The yes. second Who? the second lioness in a row mm. to win it. Three years in a row now, women have won. The last bloke to win was four years ago. Many male uh, sports stars like, for example, Ronnie O'Sullivan, mm. who should have won, yeah. saying, what's the point? We're, blokes are never going to win again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Stuart Broad, uh, the brilliant, fantastic test match career mm. for England. His final test match. His last ball with the bat, yeah. he hit for six. His last bowl with his arm, he bowled someone yeah. out. And you're telling me that the uh, goalkeeper yeah. for the Lionesses, who, by the way, screwed up and got us kicked out of the Olympic uh, qualifying rounds, you're telling me she had a better sports year yeah. than those people? Uh, no, she didn't. Uh, she won because she's a woman yeah. and they did And it's didn't. all about the message that it gives out, isn't it? And that's what they've now this become. The wokery. BBC have forgotten how to do proper journalism. Their news department has been dreadful. We haven't even talked about that, where they refuse still to call Hamas a terrorist organisation. Yep. They've, they've sort of made some slight adjustment to what they used to say. They now say, which is a prescribed terrorist organisation by many governments. You know, they got Jeremy Bowen, the veteran Middle East correspondent, who wrongly said that the Israelis had bombed the hospital. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. He then admitted he got it wrong but he didn't regret it you know just unbelievable stuff that they seem to get wrong every single time we haven't even mentioned Gary Lineker and Gary Lineker mm. seems to now well, just Gary, Gary dangle uh, whatever he wants in front of the BBC and just take the mickey out but Gary Lineker is the essence of how the BBC breaks its contract yeah. with licence fee payers so what they pledge us quite rightly for the money we have to give it and by the way, yeah. millions and millions of people are saying, enough, yeah, they're Net not doing it. Netflix is better. Yeah. But what in return for the money we give it, it owes us impartiality. It owes us unbiased reporting and it does not no. give it to us. It is biased, it is left-wing, yeah. it is woke, and that is a disgrace. And uh, before too long, trust me, trust me, the BBC licence fee will cease to exist because the idiots, who are the woke North London idiots who are running it now have broken their contract with the people and yeah. we've had enough. We have had enough. You still live in North London, don't you? Yeah, yeah. You I, I live among them. I just want to point that out. Uh, listen, coming up, uh, we're going to do a deep dive into uh, Greta Thunberg. Greta Tintin Thunberg became a climate activist at the age of 15. For many years, people refused to listen to me. Children were very mean. After gaining worldwide attention, Miss Thunberg was invited to address the United Nations. And to avoid emitting carbon, the humble teenager sailed from Plymouth to New York on a yacht worth over four million pounds. But there's no kitchen, no toilet. We all have to do it in a bucket, but I mean, that is, <laughs> that is fine. And when that £4 million yacht finally docked in New York, she reprimanded all of the world leaders for not doing the same thing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you! And when she's not munching on organic avocados flown in from far away, Greta loves a bit of karaoke. We're no strangers to love.
Sadly, young Greta has had a tough couple of weeks. First of all, she was arrested in London for being really annoying. Hello, but don't get me out to close the door. We're standing there, are we? So I'm asking you to move back. And just when she thought it couldn't get any worse, she tweeted a photo supporting Gaza without condemning Hamas. But there's more. She also included a blue octopus, which many see as an anti-Semitic symbol. But don't worry, Greta. If it all falls apart, you can always have a second career presenting the weather. And now, the weather forecast with Greta Thunberg. Hot! That was the weather with Greta Thunberg. And that was my deep dive into the weird world of Greta Thunberg. And it really is a weird world for Greta Thunberg, isn't it? She's too old now to be called the schoolgirl on strike, who's yeah. giving up her education to fight for the climate. Yeah. And that rubbish she came out with at the UN, you know, this climate extinction that we're doing, that we're all going to die, that it's an emergency. Mm. It's all BS, frankly, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah uh, Scandinavia's gift to the world, the yeah. doom goblin. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and so she said, oh, at first... They refuse to listen to me. Yeah. Hey, let me tell you, Greta, I'm still refusing to yes. listen to you, and so are millions of other sane, sentient adults, because you were a child when you were spouting this absolute green claptrap, right. this climate emergency myth, and now you're a grown woman, or you don't seem to want to admit it, but we're still refusing yeah. to listen to you. You are yodelling into the abyss, yes. and nobody cares. Get on your stupid yacht, and crap in your bucket. Nobody yeah, cares. It's true. And don't forget, when you do get in your yacht, make sure that the crew who are going to crew, crew the yacht back from New York fly out there on a plane, yeah. um, oh, and then you can come back on the yacht. Yeah. But also, she had to... Um, this year, funnily enough, 2023 is a big year for Greta, because she had to get rid of a tweet that she'd put out about five years ago, which predicted that by 2023... We'd all be dead. We'd all be either dead or underwater, uh, or suffering from some ludicrous 2% uh, increase in the temperature of the world. It's all going horribly wrong for these people. Yeah. And yet, they still keep going on demonstrating that we've got Just Stop Oil and all those idiots who keep saying that we're in a climate emergency. You pointed out a while ago, um, yeah, it's going to happen in 250 million years. Yeah, yeah. well, there was a re recent report just uh, you know, a week or so ago that, 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 that these model makers who predict the apocalypse for the planet, uh, they just go, in 200 years, uh, we're going to have a greenhouse... A uh, runaway effect and the planet will be destroyed. You know, OK, uh, well, I don't believe that for a second. And by the way, let's get this on tape right now. There is not one scintilla of scientific word, evidence man. that mankind uh, is causing climate change. Yeah. Climate change is... There's a plenty of people will tell you it is, though. Yeah, but cl climate change is, of course, happening. Climate change has always happened. Yeah. But did we do it? That's just conjecture. That's just it's conjecture. And until you prove to me I we're do. doing it, uh, I, I, no. you, know, you prove to me they're doing it, I'll be on the bridges with the Extinction Rebellion. Really? But until right, then, until you. then, Greta Thunberg, do one. Thank you very much indeed. Coming up, uh, we're going to look at our favourite old git. That's him, Jeremy Corbyn, the head, former head of the Labour Party. Welcome back to the year, according to Mike Graham. We've already seen some pretty dreadful stuff that's been going on, but who could forget there was a time when Jeremy Corbyn was once likely to become the Prime Minister of this great country of ours. Thankfully, uh, we dodged that particular bullet, but this has been a good year for Jeremy Corbyn. Let's have a look. Jeremy Corbyn became an MP in 1983. Now, most people would dress up for their first day at work, but not Jezza. Here he is wearing a scruffy jumper knitted by his mum. Is uh, that the jumper that your mum made? Yes, it is. She didn't make the shirt as well, I suppose. No, no, she didn't make the shirt. That came from the co-op. As Labour MP for Islington North, Jezza discovered early on that if there's one thing he hates, it's the Tories, especially fat Tories. There's fleets of limousines draw up and out get large Tory MPs with even larger stomachs wearing dinner jackets and they stride in to vote. A proud socialist, Jeremy has never been shy of sharing his left-wing views, even when no one wants to hear them. Since you're getting so excited and so agitated, I will, and don't be so abusive. The best thing to have happened to the environment was the fall of the Berlin Wall, so the property rights began to reverse the ecological catastrophe that Marxism had created. After becoming Labour leader in 2015, 
Jeremy was given the very best media training and always knew exactly where the cameras were. Jeremy, look at the cameras, please. Thank you very much for coming here today. No one tells Jezza what to say, except when they write it on the auto cue and he reads it out by mistake. We need to be investing in skills, investing in our young people. And, strong message here, not cutting student numbers. And much like his former girlfriend, Diane Abbott, Jeremy has always had a great head for numbers. Some even call him the human calculator. So how much will it cost? I'll give you the figure in a moment. Y you don't know it? Um, can I give you the exact figure in a moment? Is this not exactly the issue? All of our manifesto is, um, is fully costed and examined. And, but uh, you're holding a manifesto, you're flicking through it, you've got an iPad there, you've had a phone call while we're in here, and you, you, you don't know how much it's going to cost. Jeremy is a perfect specimen of man, and there's nothing he can't do, except play football against an eight-year-old boy. Now that's tricky. But with Jeremy in charge of the Labour Party, there was much to celebrate. And he couldn't resist giving Shadow Foreign Secretary Emily Thornberry a high five. Shame he missed. <laughs> and that brings us bang up to date. Jeremy may be gone, but his fans have not. Can the Labour Party ever distance themselves from the cult of Corbynism? That was my deep dive into Jeremy Corbyn. Now let's meet an expert. <laughs> And, of course, all that was done uh, earlier this year before he had his uh, set to with Piers Morgan when he came in and refused to condemn Hamas and say that they're a terrorist organisation. Oh. And he just kept shouting. And when the interview was over, he was still shouting at Piers. You could hear him, you know, like from three corridors away. Listen... Uh, He's an angry guy. Yeah, the thing I think about Keir Starmer is, uh, you know, I'm not a fan. I don't think he's a politician of talent. But he has at least realised that unless the Labour Party divorce themselves from intransigent dinosaurs yes. like Jeremy Corbyn, it will be finished very yeah. soon. And uh, interesting to see him at a younger age uh, sort of pillorying yes. Tories with their fat bellies. Yes. Have you seen his belly lately? Bit like those fat yeah. Tories he's talking about a long time ago. This guy, what an idiot. He has not changed... <laughs> A single opinion no. in 50 years. I mean, he's had those in opinions, like you say. Years. Like, some people have them when they're at university and they do a bit of marching around for, you know, human rights and all the rest yeah. of it. He's had it all his life. Yeah. Um, and But there was a time, wasn't there? And it wasn't that long ago, 2019, when there was a pretty good chance he might have won the election. Yeah, that's I think if the Tories hadn't had Boris Johnson... Yeah. I think they might have. He might have yeah, just yeah, done it, you know. Yeah, yeah, you think we're in trouble now? Yeah. If Corbyn had gone in. Oh my God! Can you imagine? Uh, and of course, uh, the great British public realised this guy. Do you remember in the run-up to the election when mm. uh, Labour began? They, they had high hopes. We're going to win. We're going to win. Yeah. And uh, they suddenly started to realise. Oh, the polls are indicating we might not. Yeah. So Corbyn sort of, we'll give you free TV licences. Yeah, we'll give right, you free right. broadband. Yeah, yeah. We'll give you a million pounds each. Vote for us. But the public went, you can't give us this. Right. Stop making false right. promises. Uh, and uh, Corbyn represents the Labour Party that no one ever wanted. Uh, Starmer, I'm afraid, represents the Labour Party that uh, he's conning the British public into thinking that yeah. they want. But don't forget, Keir Starmer was the man who wanted Jeremy Corbyn to be Prime Minister. If you want that man to be Prime Minister of this country, good luck to you, cos it'll be almost as bad. He's almost as idiotic as that sclerotic fat guy, All right. Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, oh, Jeremy Corbyn. They've stopped no, that. No, no, Jeremy, Jeremy Corbyn. Corbyn. Um, now, we've already done the BBC, um, but we're going to get a bit specialised on them now because we're going to mark the end, the sad end, and we're going to mourn the death of Newsnight. The BBC launched Newsnight in January 1980, and since then, it's taken on political leaders, embarrassed the odd royal, and been accused of a lack of impartiality, usually by me. But with rumoured budget cuts of £5 million next month, falling ratings and editor who's dramatically quit, is this the beginning of the end for the BBC's flagship news show? Where else can you see Russell Brand share these pearls of wisdom? Is it true you don't even vote? Yeah, no, I don't vote. 
Well, how do you have any authority to talk about politics then? Well, I don't uh, get my authority from this pre-existing paradigm which is quite narrow and only serves a few people. I look elsewhere for alternatives that might be of service to humanity. And who could forget when Jeremy Paxman asked Michael Howard the same question 12 times? Did you I threaten did not, to overrule him? I did not overrule Derek did Lewis. Did you threaten to overrule him? I took advice on what I could or could not did do. Did you threaten and to overrule him, Mr Howard? I scrupulously in accordance with that advice. I did not overrule Derek Lewis. Did you Lewis. threaten to overrule Mr. him? Mr Marriott was not suspended. Did you uh, threaten to overrule him? It's you, a quite you straight put, yes you or no. You question and I will, I will, give, yes you, no I will give you an did answer. Did you threaten to overrule him? Remember when Alistair Campbell embarrassed himself in front of the whole nation? We're going down a rabbit hole, and this is a pointless well, debate. Well, that's because you all talk so rubbish when you come on these programmes. Excuse me, that's just unnecessarily rude. But well, it's true. Be so I'm sorry. Arrogant. But you can always rely on Alistair to make things much, much worse. You never challenge them. You let them talk Please. utter rubbish about Brexit. And it's happened on the BBC for year after year after year. OK, that's I am not going to take that from you. And who could forget when Prince Andrew revealed his passion for Pizza Express? Going to Pizza Express in Woking is an unusual thing for me to do. A very unusual thing for me to do. Times are changing though at the BBC. Could Newsnight be first for the chop? Let's find out from a Fleet Street veteran. I mean, it does make you think, doesn't it, that Newsnight actually used to be quite yeah, a substantial exactly programme. That's exactly what I was thinking. It used to be a show that you had to watch if you were a journalist, yeah. apart from anything else, but also just if you were interested in politics. It was, it was you know, groundbreaking interviews, really good news um, uh, events yeah, would be yeah, made. Yeah. You know, people would say things they didn't say anywhere else. And now, they've just they've killed it. I mean, we talked about the BBC earlier. They've just kiboshed their own show, haven't they? Of course they have. And you saw pa Paxman, you know, in his pomp there, you know, humiliating Michael Howard. Mm. Michael Howard never recovered from no. that. No. Uh, and Paxman really did hold politicians uh, to he account. Did. He really, really did. And uh, now we've got Victoria Derbyshire. You yes. Know, uh, Who we uh, saw earlier couldn't get her shoes yeah, on. Yeah, can't even get her shoes on. Uh, that show uh, has diminished uh, beyond comprehension. Mm. Uh, it's become a left wing. It, it is the epitome of ludicrous left wing BBC right. nonsense. Good to see my co host there, uh, Alex Phillips, yeah. uh, being pilloried, being hum uh, allegedly humiliated uh, by. Uh, it's all he knows how uh, to do. Alistair Campbell. I Alistair, mean, Alistair, Alistair Campbell. Al Alistair Campbell is shouting at Victoria. Yeah. Uh, Derbyshire there, basically saying, you know, why are you letting this woman get away with saying things that I don't agree with? I, I mean, God almighty, he's, he's sad, God almighty. And Newsnight, thank God, I mean, I th thank God it's going. It has become a parody of itself. Yeah. A once great programme reduced to uselessness by the useless, woke, left-wing, disgraceful state Broadcast. It's true, very true. Coming up, uh, we're going to go and take a trip to Doctor Who. Not that we got it in for the BBC, they've got it in for themselves, I promise you. This is The Year According to Mike Graham. Now, you'd think, as I said, that the BBC was the only thing that went horribly wrong in 2023, but, I mean, it wasn't the only thing, but it was a thing, and it was a big thing, because not only did they ruin Newsnight, not only did they screw up the news division, uh, they've also sort of ruined Doctor Who. Let's have a look. Viewers all around the world used to love Doctor Who, but that was until it became woefully woke. To mark the show's 60th anniversary, the BBC brought back fan favourite David Tennant in a desperate bid to save the show from being exterminated. But sadly, producer Russell T Davis had other ideas. First up, he decided the Doctor's arch enemy Davros should no longer be in a wheelchair because he didn't want to associate disability with evil. There's a problem with the Davros of old in that uh, he's a wheelchair user who is evil. And I had problems with that and a lot of us on the production team had the problems with that of associating disability with evil. I say this is how we see Davros now. This is what he looks like. This is 2023, and he looks like this now. And that we are absolutely standing by. Next up, the Doctor is told off by a transgender character after he uses the incorrect pronoun to describe a non-binary alien. Well, we've all done that. Yes, the meat. I promise I can help him get home and then you'll never see me again. You're assuming he as a pronoun. True. Yes, sorry, good point. Are you he or she or they? My chosen pronoun is the definite article. Shakespeare would be proud. And here's how the BBC's Wokerati reacted to this incredible work 
of storytelling. It is important to show the lived reality of trans people. And there's only one way to end such a special episode, ridicule the Doctor and remind him just how rubbish men really are. We know everything, thanks. And you know nothing. It's a shame you're not a woman anymore. She'd have understood. We've got all that power, but there is a way to get rid of it. Something a male presenting Time Lord will never understand. But there's more wokery to look forward to next year with another new Doctor. Here he is explaining why Doctor Who is a beacon for marginalised people. He's a Time Lord. He's literally an alien. They are an alien. The Doctor is not from anywhere. It's like they don't fit in anywhere. And I think for marginalised people, they have been a real beacon of kind of feeling like seen in a way. Yep. Fans are fuming and viewers are threatening to boycott the show. How long can the Doctor survive? Let's find out from an expert. Uh, yeah, so apparently we know nothing because we're men. Uh, if we were women, we'd know a lot more. Uh, if we even pretended we were women, we'd know a lot more. Um, so I don't know what we're going to do now. Don't forget, uh, Doctor Who is a children's programme. Yes. It still is. Right. Uh, and so this is being used as a tool by the woke... B it's the epicentre of BBC wokery. It's being used as a tool by the BBC to brainwash kids into this yeah. absurd ethos. And by the way, apart from all that nonsense, uh, in the new series, De De David Tennant uh, come in a return yeah. as the Doctor. Yeah, as a bloke. Uh, uh, what happens is his sidekick, uh, they, 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 they're hanging out with Isaac Newton, yeah. the guy who discovered... Uh, oh, yeah, they do Isaac Newton's mixed gra race, gravity. don't they? Yeah, yeah, he's a mixed race, Isaac Newton. Uh, everybody... He wasn't mixed race, right. he was white. Yes. Uh, and uh, so uh, the, the doctor's sidekick goes, God, he's pretty hot. Yeah. And then David Tennant, the doctor, goes, yeah, he is, isn't he? And then he goes, is this who I am now? So the yeah. doctor's also gay. Uh, why are we using this children's programme you know, as a vector for this absurd wokery. Russell T. Davis there, ridiculous man, going, oh, we had a problem associating uh, evil with people in wheelchairs. Hey, Russ, yes. it is possible for people in wheelchairs to be evil. Right. Do you get that, you... Listen, I remember, I remember <laughs> Ironside. Half-wit. I remember Ironside. He was a detective in a wheelchair. It didn't mean everyone yeah. in a wheelchair was a detective, did it? No. I mean, to be honest, I've never met a real person who was a detective in a wheelchair, but there we are. Listen, um... Thank you very much You're indeed, right, Kevin mate. O'Sullivan. Uh, we'll see loads more of Kevin in 2024. you see loads more of me in 2024. Indeed. That was the year, uh, according to Mike Graham. I can't believe 2024 will be any more shocking um, <laughs> than this past year, but it might be. You never know. Keep watching Talk TV. We'll see you soon.